good morning everyone uh, i am uh, dr ashwani singhal and uh, along with my co moderator dr pranodi mandrekar uh, welcome you all uh, to today's webinar uh, which is uh, an important one uh, in the covid series uh, entitled covid 19 and alcohol associated uh, liver disease well uh, as as i mentioned uh, two of us are moderating today along with myself uh, ashwani singhal and my co moderator pranoti mandrekar uh, for today's webinar and uh, here you can see we have uh, two uh, very uh, elegant and expert uh, speakers uh, today for the webinar uh, about 20 minute presentations will be delivered by dr brenda curtis from nih Uh, who will be talking about alcohol use and how it has changed uh, it has changed during the covid-19 era and we all know that covid-19 has impacted uh, our lives uh, on a daily basis in many many ways and alcohol use may be one of them and she will tell us how it has changed and then uh, following that another 20 minutes will be spent by dr andrew moon uh, who will be telling us how this covid-19 and potentially alcohol use impacted alcohol associated liver disease in terms of uh, hospitalizations and in terms of transplants and in terms of uh, their severity and finally i think as members you can make a big difference to these webinars and i welcome you all and uh, feel free to put your questions and uh, contribute during the panel discussion at the end uh, and use the q and a box uh, for uh, putting through your questions and today's webinar uh, has been circulated to almost over 6000 asld members um, and then uh, as i mentioned uh, use the q and a box to uh, present your questions or submit your questions which will be answered either uh, while this webinar is going on or at the end in a written format uh, by the, the speakers uh, or the panelists uh, and then uh, or it can be uh, discussed during the panel discussion Dr Brenda Curtis is our first presenter she is a tenure track investigator uh, and at the NIH and she is a technology and translational research unit uh, and works and she has a lot of expert uh, expertise in uh, monitoring alcohol use using the digital platform um, uh, in 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 uh, individuals who are involved in uh, consuming lot of alcohol and our second presenter is uh, actually a little off the trajectory but an expert in his own way uh, he's a transplant fellow right now at the UNC and you all know that the secure website of cirrhosis was uh, his brain child and he was the starter of this um, uh, website uh, when the covid hit us uh, in uh, early part of the year uh, around march and uh, uh, this website has you know enrolled a lot of patients and uh, uh, high impact publications have come out and he will share some of those data with us uh, we are also uh, very uh, blessed uh, and uh, uh, fortunate to be joined with us two uh, panelists who may not be experts in the covid field but experts in their own way in clinical practice uh, specifically uh, uh, dr verna uh, uh, called betsy Uh, who is director of clinical research at Columbia University um, and director of hepatology research at the same institution and she has a lot of expertise in uh, clinical practice um, in terms of especially transplantation and in terms of general hepatology clinical practice i think oren fix uh, and also on education he is an expert on uh, hepatology and in all the aspects of hepatology i can say and uh thank you oren for joining us uh, he is the medical director uh, liver transplant program at the swedish uh, seattle uh, washington and is also associate professor at the same institution and uh, floyd college of medicine so uh, with those words i open the webinar and i invite the first speaker uh, the two talks will be one after another and then following that we will have the question and answer session but you can Uh, keep sending your questions while the talks are going on and uh, along with my co-moderator dr pranodi mandrekar i open uh, the uh, 
the, the session now and invite the first speaker, Dr. Curtis, to give her uh, talk on uh, alcohol use during COVID-19. Uh, Brenda. Thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic is a major global and national health emergency, as we all know. It has touched probably every person in the world and is likely to have long-term impact on public health and well-being. Alcohol misuse is already a public health concern in the United States with dramatic increases in emergency room department visits and alcohol-related deaths observed in recent years. But alcohol has the potential to further complicate the COVID-19 and the COVID-19 pandemic in multiple ways. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I think I was muted. I'll start back over, sorry. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is a major global and national health emergency. It has touched probably every person in the world and is likely to have long lasting impact on public health and well-being. Alcohol misuse is already a public health concern in the United States with dramatic increases in emergency room departments visits and alcohol related deaths observed in recent years. However, alcohol has the potential to further complicate the COVID-19 pandemic in multiple ways in patients with alcohol use disorder and alcohol associated liver disease may be among the most vulnerable populations and severely impacted. Next slide. Next slide. First, we must consider the effects of alcohol on the immune system. Alcohol misuse both activates the immune systems causing inflammation and interferes with the body's immune response to viral and bacterial infections. In lungs, excessive alcohol damages epithelial cells and um, is associated with acute respiratory distress syndromes. Ultimately, impaired immune system functions and an increased susceptibility to respiratory illnesses could contribute to more severe COVID-19 and greater risk of mortality. Excessive alcohol consumption not only influence COVID-19 susceptibility and severity, but the broad effects of the pandemic also are likely to lead to excessive alcohol consumption. We know from previous disasters such as 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina that the stress of the events and anxiety about the future can increase drinking and exaggerate symptoms of alcohol use disorder. We also know that feeling socially isolated a possible effect of physical distancing can worsen symptoms of anxiety and depression and may encourage more alcohol intake from the stress of unemployment to feeling isolated during physical distancing. There are many reasons that COVID-19 emergency may be influencing alcohol consumption. Indeed, we'll talk about how COVID-19 crisis appears to be influencing al record alcohol uh, retail sales. But specific to individuals with alcohol associated liver disease, many patients will be unable to attend regular outpatient visits with providers due to office closures and due to valid fears. Things like leaving their home, becoming possibly impacted, affected are, uh, by COVID-19 and potentially infecting family members, mass transit, how do they get to appointments, as well as when they're at appointments. And this is particularly an issue with patients who are immunosuppressed. Moreover, those patients who relapse or have ALD in, um, during the pandemic are unlikely to seek me medical care unless their symptoms are severe. Next. Early epidemiological and marketing data indicate a spike in the use of alcohol by the general population. The market research firm Nielsen reported that in the week ending March 21, sales of distilled liquor were 75% greater than during the same week in 2019, and beer sales were up 66%. By the end of April, compared to that same time the year before, brick and mortar alcohol doors, dollar sales were up 26%, while online sales of alcohol skyrocketed 477%. In fact, alcohol is the fastest growing e-commerce department that we currently have right now in the US. Next slide. Consumers are also buying larger amounts of alcohol for off-premise consumption. So not only are we buying more, we're buying larger amounts when we do buy, for wine and spirits in particular. 
there has been an amazing increase in what we're seeing well beyond the norm. Comparing the year ending before February, year ending February 29, to the seven weeks, the beginning of the COVID uh, epidemic that ended ending through April 18th, sales growth were 44% higher for box wine and 47% higher for uh, spirits. Beer category has also seen an amazing increase. People are buying larger amounts. As you can see, sales for your typical six pack is down, whereas sales for a 30 pack and a 24 pack is up. In the National Consumer Survey, consumers buying alcohol on premise compared to takeout orders also saw an increase. So not only are we buying more, we're buying more for home consumption and we're buying larger amounts. So I'd like to, next slide, sorry. I'd like to talk a little bit about some research that we're doing. We currently have a national sample in the field where we're collecting digital phenotyping, alcohol-related measures, and COVID-related measures. Next slide. In this study, we're examining the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on substance use, alcohol, and other drugs, drug-related behaviors, consequences of alcohol use in people with and without an alcohol use disorder or substance use disorder. We're investigating a bi-directional effect of COVID-19 pandemic with access adherence to treatment. And we're looking to improve our methodology for the detection of daily life behavioral events, movement, weight, social interactions, things like that. Next slide. Our goal is to collect data from 2,500 people online, a national sample. At baseline, we collect social media language, and we also have them complete a survey, which includes measures of depression, anxiety, drug use. We also ask them questions about their experiences during COVID, things like housing, job loss, pandemic-related stressors, uh, their, their alcohol and drug consumption. We then follow them for the first 30 days, they complete an EMA questionnaire. It's a daily diary where we ask about their mood, their alcohol, their substance use, their mask wearing, their social interactions. We then follow them up for periods of uh, two months, three months, and four months. Of the 2,500, we have a smaller sample of participants, 300, which, which download an app on their phone. And the app on their phone collects uh, smartphone sensor data and digital phenotyping data. It collects information about all the sensors in their phone. It collects information about their location, their call, their text, their physical activity. Um, well, calls, we just get logs, but text messages, we do get text messages of what they send, not what other people send them. Next. So when we look at the digital phenotyping type data, here's an example of things that we can get. Like from the accelerometer, we can get information about physical movement and daily activities. From Bluetooth, we can get information about their social interactions and also call logs and app logs. We can get information about their social interactions as well as social media language. So it gives us an idea of like what the person does digitally in order to find out and be able to make some predictions about what they're doing um, in, their, in real life. Next slide. So far the study is ongoing, but I'd like to present some of the preliminary data that we have. Um, in, the, in, in our first kind of wave of 568 people, the group on average was about 36 years old. They're mostly white with a bachelor's degree. Income is well distributed between the categories with about 45% being below 50,000 and 55% above, above 50. Many of the participants drink alcohol and use cannabis with a smaller percentage using opiates and cocaine. Next slide. Um, some of the preliminary data related to COVID-19 we're seeing is about 4% of the population report being diagnosed with COVID-19. The most, and most of them are worried about uh, either getting COVID-19 themselves or their loved ones getting COVID-19. They're experiencing greater levels of anxiety and depression, and about 77% have reported having a personal financial loss. And when we asked about increased substance use or specifically alcohol use, 28% reported having higher levels of alcohol consumption, specifically related to COVID-19. Next slide. We compare people, so remember I mentioned that we collect their social media language, 
before entering treatment. We compare their social media language from the period 2019 versus 2020. So their language pre-COVID, during COVID. And as we can see in the word cloud, this is just giving us an idea of like what people are talking about and you know what topics are they talking about more and how the topics are related. And as you can see, no surprise, is that people are talking about quarantine, socially distancing, masks, coronavirus, and the pandemic. Those were the most often used words in 2020, which tracks to what we should see. There's also words related to the US election, the Black Lives and the Black Lives Matter movement. On the right, we did a language analysis. You can see we, did, we took our language analysis, um, machine learning tools, and we looked to see kind of what is in the language for doing the COVID pandemic. Um, and as you can see, we have a 17% increase in stress related language and a 12% increase in negative emotion and a 3% increase in uh, depression. Um, next slide. We are still learning what the impact of COVID-19 will be of patients who have an alcohol use disorder and have alcohol related liver disease. The early indicators are pointing to an increase in alcohol consumption and an increase in alcohol related behaviors. In a study conducted in the UK by Dr. Kim and colleagues, they reported that lockdown causes different behavior changes on alcohol intake with about 20% of individuals increasing uh, or decreasing the normal amount of alcohol consumption. And although psychosocial distress were, you know, everyone was having, it was not, um, it was well, rec as well recognized as a risk for relapse and everyone is experiencing it. And it's also known as an increase in alcohol consumption. Reduction might be associated with decreased financial ability. So one of the things that we've noticed, you know, I mentioned is that 77% reported having a financial loss. And we're wondering if sometimes when people report, when we're seeing data of decrease in alcohol use that is actually maybe related to having access to alcohol. So from our data, we're seeing people, you know, are reporting alcohol increase, but we're also getting some people reporting a decrease in alcohol. So one of the things that we'd like, we're trying to say is that we need to see who is more likely to increase alcohol use and who's more likely to decrease alcohol use. And we're hoping that the digital phenotype will give us an idea of the patients that we need to target going more. Thank you. You can skip ahead, there you go. So thank you for that uh, great talk, Dr. Curtis. Uh, my name's Andrew Moon. I'm an advanced transplant hepatology fellow at the University of North Carolina. Um, I'd like to thank the ASLD and uh, Drs. Mandrakar and Singal for the kind invitation to speak about the potential impacts of COVID-19 on alcohol-associated liver disease. Next slide. I have no relevant conflicts of interest and my research was supported by a T32 grant from the NIH. Next slide. Before delving into the potential impact of COVID-19 on alcohol-associated liver disease, it's worth noting the high and increasing ALD burden prior to COVID-19. Next slide. Seen on the left, we know from national commercial claims data that the diagnosis of alcohol-associated cirrhosis is on the rise. Despite the relatively modest increases in the prevalence of alcohol-associated cirrhosis, the inpatient costs attributable to ALD have skyrocketed, as demonstrated by the figure on the right. According to recent estimates from the national inpatient sample, Inpatient costs from ALD now total more than every other liver disease etiology combined. Next slide. National data from UNOS demonstrate that there's been a nearly 50% increase in liver transplantation for alcohol-associated liver disease since 2002. The figure on the right demonstrates that much of this rise is due to an increase in, in the number of transplants for alcohol-related hepatitis. Next slide. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, recent data suggests that mortality from alcohol-associated liver disease is also increasing. Recent national death certificate data from the U.S. CDC demonstrate that ALD deaths per 100,000 population 
have been significantly rising from 1999 to 2017 with a statistically significant acceleration among women after 2013. As demonstrated by this table, the average annual percentage changes in mortality rates have been most pronounced among individuals aged 25 to 34, with particularly striking increases in young women. Next slide. Before we delve into the collateral damage of this pandemic on our patients, it's worth mentioning that those with alcohol-associated liver disease may be particularly susceptible to poor outcomes from COVID-19 infection. Next slide. There are many reasons why alcohol use and alcohol-associated liver disease may predispose to worse outcomes from COVID-19. First, alcohol use disrupts the innate and adaptive immune systems. Second, as demonstrated with other viral infections, chronic alcohol consumption is associated with an increased susceptibility to acute respiratory distress syndrome. And third, patients with alcohol use disorder often have other comorbidities, including metabolic syndrome and CKD. Next slide, please. However, However, there are now some direct evidence that ALD patients fare worse with COVID-19, even when accounting for these comorbidities. Our data from the Secure Cirrhosis and COVID-HEP registries demonstrated that after adjustment for these comorbidities, ALD etiology, along with age and child Pew score, was associated with an increased risk of mortality in COVID-19. Next slide. Effects unrelated to the viral infection itself may prove to have the biggest effect on our ALD patients. Undoubtedly, COVID-19 will enact massive collateral damage via the effects of deferred care, medication non-adherence, and as Dr. Curtis pointed out, increased alcohol use. Next slide. The pathophysiology of alcohol-associated liver disease is complex, but overall alcohol dose and pattern of consumption are both strongly implicated in the risk of ALD. Increased alcohol consumption during COVID, therefore, has the potential to lead to increased morbidity and mortality for our patients. However, this may also exacerbate pre-COVID disparities between men and women in the burden of ALD. As we know, the threshold of unsafe alcohol use is much lower for women than men. Next slide, please. In addition, based on national claims data, women are less likely to utilize substance abuse treatment visits and relapse prevention medications. This may be due to attitudinal barriers, more perceived stigma, and conflicting family or child care responsibilities. There are already some early signs that these disparities are increasing in the COVID-19 era. During the pandemic, women have taken on a disproportionate amount of work at home and have borne a higher economic burden than men. There's some early data suggesting this may be leading to larger increases in alcohol use and alcohol-associated health effects in women. Next slide. Across the board, increases in alcohol use have fairly clear effects on mortality in patients with alcohol-associated liver disease. This study from France prospectively followed all inpatients with biopsy-proven severe alcohol-related hepatitis treated with corticosteroids. These patients were followed at regular intervals for a median of 42 months and were assessed periodically for alcohol intake. The study had several important findings. First, among non-responders to steroids, mortality was an astounding 70% at six months. Second, as demonstrated in the plot below, those who were, uh, sorry, there is a clear association between alcohol dose and long-term mortality. Compared to those who were abstinent, there was an increase in mortality with as little as 30 grams of alcohol per day, which is approximately two standard drinks. Consumption of 100 grams per day conferred an adjusted hazard ratio of six for death compared to no alcohol consumption. Next slide. Similar findings have been demonstrated in patients with biopsy-proven alcohol-associated cirrhosis. This study performed in the UK followed patients prospectively after they received a diagnosis of alcohol-related cirrhosis based on liver biopsy. Abstinence from alcohol at one month after cirrhosis diagnosis was significant.
After seven years, mortality was 66% in patients who were not abstinent at a month compared to 28% in those who were abstinent. Next slide. As Dr. Curtis has pointed out, a number of COVID-related factors have the potential to increase alcohol use in patients with alcohol use disorder or excess drinking. Given the association between alcohol use and poor outcomes in ALD, this has the potential to lead to direct alcohol-related health effects, including alcohol-related hepatitis and liver-related mortality. Furthermore, depending on institutional requirements for pre-transplant abstinence, alcohol relapses could lead to waitlist drop-off in pre-liver transplant patients. While it's too early to fully assess the effect of changes in alcohol consumption patterns in the wake of COVID-19, um, there's some early data that are concerning. Next slide. In the spring of 2020, as the American COVID-19 outbreak was beginning, there are some early signs that cirrhosis patients were already were delaying care. These data from the National VA healthcare system showed a rapid drop off in cirrhosis admissions beginning in March of 2020 compared to historic data from the prior year. Patients admitted in the late COVID era had higher MELD scores, suggesting that only the sickest patients were coming in for care. <clears throat> In addition, there was a very slight increase in the proportion of cirrhosis-related hospitalizations among patients with ALD compared to other etiologies. Next slide, please. What about an increase in admissions for alcohol-related hepatitis? I know many would say that based on anecdotal experience, there has been an increase in such admissions. To help answer this question a bit more definitively, we pulled the monthly counts of patients with ICD-10 codes for alcohol-related hepatitis within the UNC Health System, which includes academic and community hospitals and clinics. The red line signifies when North Carolina State Home Order was put in place in late March. Compared uh, to May through October 2019, there's been a 34% increase in cases of alcohol-related hepatitis in May through October of 2020. It's worth mentioning that this analysis relies on ICD codes that have been previously been shown to be unreliable for identifying alcohol-related hepatitis. However, uh, given that this bias is, is likely to be non-differential in the pre and post-COVID eras, these trends remain really concerning. Next slide. Changes in alcohol consumption in the COVID era could also have huge implications on our patients listed for transplant. As mentioned by Dr. Curtis, investigators in the UK performed a telephone survey among individuals with pre-existing alcohol use disorders two months after their national lockdown began. Among patients who were abstinent prior to the lockdown, 17% experienced a relapse during lockdown. If similar patterns of alcohol relapse are occurring in patients listed for transplant, this could threaten the listing status of many patients. Next slide, please. In conclusion, prior to COVID-19, alcohol-associated liver disease had a massive and growing burden in the United States and worldwide. Early in the COVID-19 pandemic, we observed worse outcomes from COVID-19 infections among patients with ALD. There has been significant collateral damage related to the pandemic, including psychosocial strain and limited access to healthcare, which may be leading to more high-risk drinking. Increases in the frequency and amount of alcohol intake clearly has the potential to increase morbidity and mortality in patients with ALD. There are already some early signs that these patients are experiencing some poor outcomes in the wake of COVID including delays in care and an increase in alcohol-related hepatitis. Furthermore, an increase in relapses or an inability to confirm sobriety in the COVID era has the potential to lead to transplant listing challenges for many patients. Next slide. I'd like to quickly take the opportunity to express my deep appreciation for everyone on the front line of this pandemic and thank all the busy clinicians who took the time to submit cases uh, to, to our registries, which were launched to help us learn more about COVID-19 in patients with chronic liver disease. 
I'd like to thank the ASLD who's uh, recently officially endorsed Secure Cirrhosis and, and thank you all for this kind invitation. I really look forward to an interesting panel discussion. Well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Brenda and Andrew for uh, this uh, very comprehensive and yet within time, uh, sticking to your time uh, presentations. Um, and I think uh, all the panelists and everybody attendees would agree that uh, the, all the dots were connected from how the COVID-19 can impact alcohol use and how that can translate into clinical events, uh, as Andrew pointed out. So before I hand over this to uh, my co-moderator for kicking uh, the panel discussion, um, I would like to say that this uh, uh, webinar today is an amalgamation of two uh, SIGs uh, from alcohol-associated uh, liver disease as well as from the clinical practice uh, SIG. And we are also joined and supported uh, from two staff members of the ASLD, John Lingerfeld, uh, who is uh, managing very uh, nicely all the SIGs uh, in, in addition to the two SIGs uh, are here today. And also Colleen, um, uh, who is uh, supporting at the backside uh, for uh, these presentations. Uh, so Purnoti, uh, can you, uh, uh, or if you would like to summarize uh, today's presentations and then uh, start the discussion and take questions from the uh, audience uh, for uh, the webinar today. Yes, thank you very much. So I'd like to, um, first of all, thank both the speakers for outstanding presentations. Um, given how much limited data we have in terms of COVID-19 and alcohol consumption, as well as alcohol associated liver disease, I think we've heard uh, much that, that we can learn from. Um, I also want to thank all, our panelists for uh, Dr. Fix and Dr. Werner for joining us today. Um, and let me start by the first question that appeared in the Q&A, um, and then we'll progress into additional questions. Um, so the first question is, do, not, do you not think that coronavirus can affect liver function directly? Uh, Dr. Moon, would you like to take that? Yeah, um, so I, I, I think um, it's still really early uh, in terms of the data that's coming out and we're learning more and more about how coronavirus may affect uh, the liver. We know that um, based on our data and, and the data from New York and, and many others, um, that patients with uh, cirrhosis and particularly decompensated cirrhosis tend to fare poorly when they get COVID-19, particularly when they're hospitalized. Um, I, th I think there are a lot of potential mechanisms which COVID-19 could affect the liver. One is uh, direct viral insult, and Dr. Verna's group had a very nice paper um, in which they look at the pathology findings of, of many patients with COVID-19 and stain them uh, for, for the virus. I think the cytokine storm that comes with COVID-19 um, could affect um, the liver uh, patients with cirrhosis and, and particularly alcohol-related cirrhosis have well-known uh, cirrhosis-associated immune dysfunction, which may play a role. And then lastly, ischemia related to the COVID-19, hypoxia and the microthrombi from the thromboembolic complications could all affect the liver as well. Thank you very much. Um, would either of the panelists like to add to that? Please go ahead. Dr. Fix, would you? I think uh, uh, Betsy might be able to speak a little bit more specifically about this, but there are autopsy data showing direct viral infection. So uh, certainly a COVID-19 hepatitis is possible, but we don't know the clinical significance of that. Um, it may not be that significant, um, but you know we've seen on pathology studies that there is evidence of nonspecific hepatitis. So. Certainly direct infection is, is likely, but we don't know if that's really contributing to the comorbidities that we're seeing with, uh, with COVID-19 in patients with liver disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Borna. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, certainly a lot of patients with COVID-19, especially hospitalized patients have 
abnormal liver tests, elevated liver tests, although it's usually mild. Um, but there is a subgroup of patients, I would say, that have a much more sort of robust hepatitis, at least based on liver enzymes. And um, like everybody has said, I think this is due to lots of different factors, especially for patients that make their way into the ICU, including um, drug-induced liver injury, as well as ischemia, um, congestion, you know, non-liver sources, particularly of AST. But I think there really is mounting evidence of sort of a direct virally mediated insult to the liver, as well as a really robust host immune response effect. And in our own data in the pathology series, we were able to PCR out the virus from path specimens. Um, it tended to correlate with the lever, level of lens, liver enzyme elevation in those patients. Um, we did find typical virally mediated findings as well as endovascular findings and other things that we've learned about um, sort of impact um, patients with COVID-19 in a multi-organ way. Um, and other investigators have demonstrated the presence of the virus as well. And of course, we do know that the receptor for the virus is present in the liver, largely in cholangiocytes, although probably to a lesser degree in hepatocytes as well. So I think all of those factors go into why this is such an important um, group of patients to think about, both patients with chronic liver disease um, and also alcohol-related hepatitis in terms of the additional insult of the virus on top of that. I think uh, this was uh, very nicely uh, put together. Uh, agree with everybody in terms of uh, transaminitis and liver function in these patients, and not to forget that they may have coexisting uh, or pre-existing liver diseases, uh, Hep B, Hep C, or uh, fatty liver disease, which could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, hiding in the back as a cause of uh, transaminitis. So uh, can I, uh, uh, you know, intervene and uh, say if uh, Dr. Fix and Dr. Verna can present their own or talk about their own experiences, what they have seen in their practices, uh, or uh, connecting with people or networking in terms of how COVID-19 has impacted for general hepatology, if Oren can uh, talk about that and specifically to transplant if uh, Betsy can talk about it. Sure, so I think, you know, it's nice that Andrew put some data to, to what we think we're seeing. Um, th th there's this, uh, you know, impression, and I've talked to hepatologists across the country through our work with, with COVID that um, we're probably seeing more patients with alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis either in the hospital or coming through our clinics. Um, clearly patients are expressing, uh, you know, uh, increased anxiety and stress and, and increased drinking uh, because of the isolation and, and uh, all the other stressors that come with COVID, sort of the, the data that uh, Dr. Curtis showed us. Um, so I think that's really bearing out in, in practice, but uh, it's hard to know, you know, this is all, you know, we're really focused on that. It's hard to know in comparison to previous years if it's really that different. And I don't know that we're necessarily managing patients any differently, uh, you know, in terms of their alcohol use or their uh, or their alcohol use disorders or their liver disease. Um, you know, certainly when I'm recommending alcohol treatment for patients, I, I'm asking them to avoid group meetings. Um, and I know that there's a lot of options for online meetings. I actually had some patients, uh, you know, really excited that they're participating in AA across the world now, and so their their story is getting out. Uh, to more than just their local community. So there's some silver linings to that. Um, I've also had some patients who have had some really good insight into their alcohol use and have managed to stop drinking uh, while they're alone at home because they know that that's going to lead to you know, very bad outcomes. So it's not across the board uh, bad, but I think it probably is in general uh, an increased risk of drinking, increased uh, uh, presentations of alcohol hepatitis, and we're having to consider a liver transplant uh, in these patients. One question that we, we could probably answer later in the discussion is when, when we consider more of a holistic approach to patients with uh, alcohol, uh, liver disease and, and transplant, um, do some of these patients get a pass because of the unusual circumstances of being isolated and, and drinking more and not having the, the um, resources that would normally be available outside of the pandemic? Uh, do we consider them at perhaps lower risk of post-transplant relapse because of the unique circumstances of what's happening during the pandemic. Yeah, thank you, uh, Oren. I think uh, you bring a great point of uh, what are the risk factors of uh, increasing alcohol use during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that's a great point you make. 
and I don't know whether there are data to connect whether the alcohol uh, consumption, uh, and maybe Brenda can chip in, whether the alcohol consumption using the digital platforms and high risk areas, whether that translates into some of the other factors like socioeconomic factors or uh, employment, for example, because we know that COVID-19 has impacted employment too in, in a great way across the world and the U.S. in specific. So I don't know whether we have that kind of data. But we actually... In terms of identifying high-risk individuals, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, no, I, I interrupt you. We actually were looking just at that um, in our data set, the, the national data we're doing, and the strongest correlation that we're seeing right now with our mental health measures as well as our audit C scores is a person reporting that they've been highly impacted by COVID. Because remember, we're doing kind of the EMA every day. And when we see people reporting being more impacted by COVID on a daily basis, we see higher levels of distress, higher levels of depression, anxiety, as well as alcohol consumption. The other thing that the, the employment is a very interesting thing. So we're seeing you know, about a third of patients saying they're drinking more and about a third of patients saying they're drinking less and our, our participants, I shouldn't say patients, of participants. And one of the things that we were wondering and we're going to be investigating is how that relates to the economic situation because on one hand with the buying of more alcohol and the buying of larger amounts of alcohol, they're actually cheaper types of alcohol. So, and we know the relationship between cheaper alcohol consumption and higher levels of alcohol consumption. So while people are having less money, they're buying cheaper alcohol and in larger amounts. So we'll be able to kind of tease some of that out, but the, also the drinking at home, the alcohol sales, the drinking at home, we're saying um, that could be that people who have, you know, they would typically be drinking socially. Now they're able to, you know, they're, they're consuming more at home. So impact still unknown, but it's looking like for, for a group of people, we are seeing higher levels of alcohol consumption as directly related to COVID-19 being stressful in their lives. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Berna, you wanted to talk about uh, transplant practice, uh, uh, how it's changed in COVID-19? Sure. Um, you know, I think COVID-19 has changed really almost every aspect of transplantation, I would say, all the way from donors to procurements to um, management of the wait list and our post patients. Um, I think for patients with alcohol-related liberties, in particular, um, people with more alcohol-related hepatitis and this acute severe uh, group of patients that we're now doing early transplants for, just to sort of echo what other people said, I think one challenge is that COVID has created a lot of barriers to what is normally a very elaborate, um, you know, assessment of the patient and their family structure. Um, and one of the things that I think has been really hard for all of our transplant patients is that they've had less support in the hospital, I would say, with restrictions that, you know, come and go and sometimes are more strict than other times, depending on the local disease transmission rates. But there's been times when really patients have to go through the whole transplant eval process, the transplant and recovery really without that um, support around them from their family and their care partners. And patients that are being transplanted for, you know, severe alcohol related hepatitis, I think is probably the very most challenging group for us to do that for. I think it's made evaluating those patients sufficiently very challenging. And then thinking about how to care for them after the transplant when they now have to, um, face relapse prevention and recovery really for the first time in many circumstances in the setting of all of these barriers, I think we can't underestimate how difficult that really is. So I would agree with Oren. I, I definitely have some patients that actually have really enjoyed the virtual meetings and attend AA meetings all over the country. They attend them in towns where they used to live and towns where they have friends. Um, but for the people where this was really their first understanding of their illness, I think this is a really hard time to be in the hospital and, and severely ill from that type of liver disease. Thank you for that, Dr. Verna. I'm, I'm just curious because um, as I said in the beginning that uh, there's limited research right now. So could you speak a, a little bit about, you know, the limitations in, in clinical research because of that, that is for the impact due to COVID-19 
and and how that you know what do you what do you see as a long term effect of this as well as do you think there's any guidelines that that um, that we need to think of and, and stuff like that so sure so um, I think many people on this call could attest to this but I think um, clinical research has been a huge challenge uh, since the pandemic started. And, um, you know, while there's been a big shift towards COVID related research, which is obviously very important, um, you know, chronic liver disease research, which is also remains important, I think um, it's gonna have a lot of limitations in terms of the studies that have been ongoing this year and, and possibly, you know, even for at least a year to come. Um, I think this has led to some innovations that hopefully will help us do better research in the future. I think moving towards um, app-based research, digital you know, tools, um, telehealth-based tools, uh, thinking about accessing networks of patients that will have easier and more equitable access to clinical research and clinical trials. I think those are all positives that I hope we take with us out of this very difficult time. But, you know, even after we started to ramp up clinical research, at least, you know, here in New York uh, this fall, you know, patients really are not interested in coming in person to the medical center if they don't really have a good reason to do that. And I think that includes being enrolled in clinical trials and cohort studies where they need to be seen in person. And we need to really rethink how, how to do these studies and, and acquire the information that we need, but in a, a safe and efficient and potentially more remote way. I'd love to hear what the other panelists think about this as well. Yes, I think this is more of a, of a question for everyone. So Dr. Fix, would you like to go next? And then we can go to our speakers. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think that uh, we're learning a lot from not just uh, clinical practice, but also clinical research during this time that hopefully we can use to improve access to, to clinical trials in the future, uh, especially for underrepresented populations in, in clinical trials. Um, you know, some of the issues that we're seeing in in clinical practice with telemedicine, where you know not everybody has access to uh, to the technology, that's that's going to be a problem if we try to implement those technologies in clinical research as well. So I think the problems are are kind of parallel in terms of research and practice in those senses. But I think uh, again, I, I'm trying to be optimistic about some of the lessons we're learning from from COVID and, and hope that some of these things will be uh, accessible to us post COVID. Yeah, Thank I know what. Yeah, go ahead. Please. I was going to say at NIDA, we've been having some success. Uh, it's still, you know, recruitment is still very slow, and we're taking, you know, baby steps. Mm -hmm. But you know, we have moved a lot online as far as using digital tools. The other part is, you know, we've rearranged our. <laughs> it sounds odd. We've rearranged our our treatment rooms and our research rooms. We've we set up a two-way camera type situation where, you know, it's almost like looking at a real person where we can see what they're typing and they, we can communicate that way so that, you know, people aren't in the rooms. Um, and, you know, we've done everything we can, you know, really of changing the structure. And of course, like David Epstein, one of the investigators, we keep pointing out at, at what point are we changing the situation so that we have removed the person completely out of it and we may be damaging our research. So, you know, this is a tightrope that we're, you know, we're seeing and we're just going day by day. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a great insight. Um, I was also wondering about uh, the present, in your presentation, you mentioned about, um, you know, that the, the rate of, and, and the amount of alcohol that is being, that is being purchased is going up uh, phenomenally. Uh, do you think that that, correlates based on some of your research, does it correlate with consumption? Um, and, and the fact that we have digital platforms and considering, you know, the, the social stigma, how much of, of this is really, um, you know, are you gathering the information that you need? Yeah, um, well, the, the interesting, you know, kind of, you know, we live our research, right? The reason that I started the survey was, you know, second week into COVID. And you know, all of my, all of my friends, many of my friends, were sending around these like drinking photos of like, guess I'll just stay home and drink. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the initial question of well, how much? You know, we were initially concerned with people not receiving treatment, and kind of were just focusing that way. And that's when we decided, you know, let's look at a national sample because when you think of the pyramid of people with an alcohol use disorder, there's many people that don't get treatment that still are having um, high levels of use, as you guys know. 
And so, but what we are finding is that alcohol consumption is increasing, or at least the daily reports of it are increasing. So I, I don't think that people are stocking up like they did with toilet paper and have a basement full of vodka. Uh, because if you look at the charts that I showed, it's not that they spiked and then went down, they spiked and then continued to go up from year to year. So people bought a large amount and decided that they could continue to keep buying that large amount. So um, I'm smiling, it's not a good thing, but you know, I, we think that it's, we're going to see this uh, through time. It's okay. a good point because I, I was wondering from your data, you know, I, I've been using a lot more, uh, you know, DoorDash and, and uh, you know, there's so much of the, the Russian toilet paper being, being a pandemic, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with eating more or using the bathroom more. So I'm glad to see that there's, there's other data showing that this is really correlating with more alcohol use. I'm not well, glad we, to see, but I'm glad yeah, that, that we have that evidence. And we're also seeing, you know, the, the restaurant on-premise versus off-premise sales. Um, the, when you think about the off-premise sales, those are places that were selling, they sell alcohol, you know, for you to either drink there or to take. And there's a higher increase of people buying liquor there to take home. So, yeah, I think uh, all all great points were made, and uh, in terms of especially research, and uh, when this COVID pandemic hit, uh, uh, and in America it was somewhere around mid March or something, when a lot of guidelines and a uh, lot of uh, implications were set into place, and. Uh, uh, Betsy, uh, Dr. Verna has been one of the co-authors of the ASLD guidelines mm -hmm. uh, on COVID uh, practices, I think. So that was the time when even NIH came up with uh, uh, these uh, some kind, kind of guidelines regarding conducting research during this COVID-19 era. And that may have also impacted. I haven't seen my coordinator face to face uh, for since April. Um, um, and it is getting hard for them to come and talk to patients face to face. I don't know how other institutions are in terms of uh, coordinated talking face to face to the patients because they can work, um, uh, you know, uh, from home remotely. So, Andrew, do you want to say something about mm -hmm. uh, research? Uh, I just want to admit, uh, make mention of the document that um, you had just discussed, the, uh, the document on clinical research um, that involved both Dr. Verna and Fix. Um, so there, there's a specific uh, portion. Um, yeah, I found the entire document really helpful um, uh, for my clinical research, but there's a, a, a specific section on tips for early career investigators. Um, and, and it's um, some ways that fellows and um, early career investigators who, who are trying to get things up and running and maybe running into uh, trouble with COVID uh, can get involved, including you know, systematic review, doing an extensive literature review and inviting uh, you know, a, a leader in the field to write a review with them, uh, writing clinical research protocols, uh, coming up with a research question and presenting it via Zoom, like a work in progress to get feedback on, on more senior folks in the division and getting more involved in um, the peer review process, which I think can be really valuable for early career investigators. So I, I just, um, you know, wanted to share that as a, as a fellow researcher, um, that was very valuable and um, um, particularly in this tough time for clinical research. That's a great point, Dr. Moon, because I, I think thinking of early career investigators, something that we have been thinking at our institution as well, the, the limitations, I think reviewers have to really take this in mind um, as we see, you know, progress for, for um, our next generation scientists. Sorry, Dr. Fix, can you? Oh, no, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I just, to, to take this discussion of clinical research back to alcohol, I, I wonder, you know, we were talking before the webinar um, as we're preparing to go live, that, that we're not finding a lot of data about, uh, you know, the pandemic's effect on alcohol flavors. There is some, but most of the data is, you know, showing that there's increased use of alcohol and it's tied to depression, anxiety, social isolation, all of those things. And we presume that it's going to be impacting our, our clinical practice in, in alcohol liver disease and alcohol hepatitis and transplant. But what, what do we do to get at that data? And do we have to wait, you know, until this pandemic is over to really see the effects? And, and do we need to wait for data to start to intervene? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, 
Dr. Barna, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think um, I would agree with everything that was said. I think, you know, number one, I think we do need to focus a lot on junior investigators, but also junior faculty members and trainees who I think have, you know, this has been a very, very challenging time to be a trainee or earlier in your career. I think obviously it's been challenging for everybody, but in particular, oftentimes um, our, our young faculty members and trainees have been redeployed. They are raising families, they have young kids, they're trying to get their research careers off the ground. Um, and so I think we all need to sort of focus on their career development and their emotional and health as well. Um, I think that, uh, thank you, Andrew, for mentioning some of the things that we tried to say that perhaps people could do when they are at home um, and when they can't see patients in person to continue their research and their academic pursuits. And I think one thing that sort of brings um, both what Andrew and Oren said together, for example, as we were talking before the webinar about how to get at this um, idea of increased alcohol-related liver disease in this setting and how we can use um, large data sets and um, you know, resources within our ho own hospital, including ICD codes, but also clinical data warehouse type data um, to do these types of analyses. And I think it's extremely important for us to all stay connected in forums like this. And, um, you know, now that we're all have meetings that are on Zoom, we can have, you know, work groups and collaborations across the country to discuss these things in this difficult time. And I think working on ways to continue to discover new things and document the impact of the pandemic on liver disease through these sort of innovative ways um, is really important. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Moon, I had a question in terms of some of the data you presented uh, where uh, there has been a steady um, sort of increase in women um, that, that are um, you know, showing an increase in alcohol-associated liver disease. Have you seen any age-related differences? There's such a stark difference between you know, how COVID-19 uh, infections in, in, you know, related to age. So have you seen any of that in, particularly in the alcohol um, or liver disease uh, populations? Do you, do you mean as, as far as new admissions for alcohol-related hepatitis or as far as um, outcomes in, in patients who have COVID-19? Mostly outcomes. Have you seen any differences in, in ages? Um, like, because it seems that the younger population, even though they get, you know, they are testing positive, may not really um, have any clinical outcomes or sometimes don't show any um, symptoms as well. So, yeah, that's a good, great question. Um, so uh, we, we have seen um, um, some stark age related differences. Um, we, for our, our, our recent paper, um, that was published in the Journal of Hepatology. We compared uh, patients with chronic liver disease and cirrhosis who had COVID-19 to, uh, to uh, controls who, who did not have chronic liver disease. As you may expect in the control group, there are very few uh, deaths, ICU stays, uh, intubations among patients in the 20 to 30 um, uh, year old age categories. That was not the case among patients with cirrhosis. We saw a much more equal distribution and we saw uh, many more deaths among those age groups. So I think um, one takeaway was that, um, you know, young age does not necessarily protect you if you have underlying cirrhosis and particularly decompensated cirrhosis. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do not see any questions in the q and I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, would like, to, would any of the panelists and speakers like to add any final thoughts? Dr. In Curtis? Book, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I thought you said you wanted. I wasn't sure if there was. No. So I'd like to uh, thank both the speakers for their wonderful presentations. Um, just really, this is this is so well, very timely, and and really um, gives insights into on, into where we are with COVID nineteen and alcohol associated liver disease. And I'm looking forward to more um, data, more research, and more information coming out over the next few months. 
I would like to also thank both our panelists, Dr. Fix and Dr. Verna, for their insights into um, their own experiences and, and their own research through um, COVID-19, related to COVID-19 and, and alcoholic-associated liver disease. So with that, uh, Ashwani, did you want to add anything? No, I think uh, you, you, you wrapped it up well, uh, Pranoti, as you always do. Uh, you, you're becoming a doyen in this, I think, and uh, uh, handling. So thank you for joining me and uh, uh, giving that kind of support. I really appreciate you. And, uh, and also all the uh, speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Curtis, uh, Dr. Moon, and the panelists, and uh, Dr. Fix and Dr. Verna, and I think uh, we cannot thank enough uh, uh, for all of you giving time and uh, making this a success. And I just saw in the chat box, uh, student community from Turkey. So we are being watched in Turkey too. Turkey. Um, yeah, student transplant community in Turkey, uh, sending their greetings. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and I think uh, we can all wrap up uh, here and uh, look forward to more people watching this as they recorded because we had over 200 uh, joined us uh, in terms of registrations. But as in most webinars, and that is my experience, um, uh, live presentations or live participation is less, but recorded uh, webinar is watched by all the registrants and maybe more, so. Great. So thank, thank you, you for the opportunity. It's been great. Uh, thank, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.